Today we are going to break out our friend, the number line, to analyze the signs of our rational function. We did it with polynomial, but you guys did not embrace the number line and the test point. You kind of embrace multiplicity as an end behavior. Uh, so if you embrace test points and number lines, this will be a little bit easier for you, okay? Our goal is to determine when our rational functions are like positive or negative. And just to show you why we're going to do what we're doing, we can see that rational functions that have asymptotes and zeros change signs at both of those locations. You see this function f of x is positive. These are positive values. We're going up towards positive infinity. We're talking about behavior around a vertical asymptote uh, more later. We can see that we do not have a point at the vertical asymptote, and then we quickly shift to having negative values to the other side of our vertical asymptote. It won't always be like that, but you know, here we can see there is a sign change at a vertical asymptote. We see at this zero, we change signs again. So our goal is to be able to produce our sign chart, focusing on our possible sign change locations, which are our zeros and our vertical asymptotes. These are both possible sign change locations. What is going to be different, though, maybe I should do it here, is you guys usually did not put down your value um, above the numbers. You put down, like, the zeros, negative 3 and 1, like, for your polynomials. But now you got to put down that negative 3 is the location of a vertical asymptote. You can either write VA there, maybe to help you, or you could say it's an un. One is the location of our zero. Again, we know this because of like our tops and our bottoms with our rationals, just like we did on our quiz. You will be using test points to determine the sign. If you plugged in something like two, okay, if I plug something in two into this rational function, I get a positive divided by a positive. Okay, well, that's for sure positive. You could use multiplicities from there. You see the factor x minus 1 has a multiplicity of 1, which means to the left and right of x equals 1, this factor will change signs. If you look at x plus 3, this factor, it's got a multiplicity of 1. If you look to the left and right of negative 3, the sign of this will change. So you could say, okay, multiplicity of 1, change signs. Multiplicity of 1, change signs. What's not going to be able to be done is like using n behavior and the fact that you understand like the degree and the leading coefficients. The redundancy that we had with polynomials, we don't have with rational. We have to use test points, but we can use multiplicity. Okay, now answer this question for me because I want you to make a mistake. What is our function less than or equal to zero? When is my function less than or equal to zero? You have to understand if that's positives or negatives, guys. Okay, and then you got to write down your intervals. You have your signs. Okay, you should be able to look at your sign to then answer the question. Careful, Gula. You made the common mistake most people make. Same with you, Kutzler, and that's okay. Everybody makes this mistake once or twice. Very nice, Thomas. 
We paid attention to the details. Come on, come on. We're, we're like, what's the answer here, Mike? What are we waiting for? Write down the answer. What, Mike, what does it mean to be less than or equal to zero? Tell me. Yeah, what does that mean? Sure, what does that mean? Positive or negative? Negative. Okay. Mike, it's right here. Now write it down. What are you negative or equal to zero? Hold on a second here. What? That's nice. <laughs> nice. All right. No, one is the X value. Okay. All we have to do is look at our sign analysis, say negative. Now here's where we make mistakes. Zero. This is not a zero. This is an und. So since it's an und, we are not including it. We would either say not including negative three, including one, or using inequality notation, you have to be comfortable with both. We are greater than negative three. We are less than or equal to one. Okay, skip a page, skip two pages, go to the third page. I said skip two pages, I think. Go straight to page 12, great. All right. If you are asked to solve a rational inequality, just like we did, just like we did on day one, we look at all of our zeros, okay? Zeros from the top, zeros from the bottom. Boom, we list them off. Okay, write down all the zeros, and what are they? Are they zeros? Are they vertical acids? So let's start with that and put it on the side. Write down all your zeros, and are they zeros or are they vertical asymptotes? Start with that. Good. We got negative two. Negative two is a zero in the bottom. That's a vertical asymptote grade. We got negative three and negative five. Those are zeros in the top. Those are zeros. Step two, bring back your friend, Mr. Number Line. Put all of these points down. These are our important X values where we have possible sign changes. All of our zeros, whether they are top or bottom or both, are important X values. We throw them down. But we make sure above those specific locations, we identify if they are indeed a zero or they're an und slash a vertical asymptote. So we will write down what ones are vertical asymptote VA, which ones are zero. That's a zero. That's a zero. This is an und. Got it? We now fill out a sign chart so we can answer the question, when are we greater than or equal to zero? Just like with polynomials. We start with one test point somewhere, and then we can fill out our other intervals using our multiplicities, noticing that we don't have any things twice, which means signs will have to change to the left and right of all of these zeros. We don't have any squares. We don't have any things that occur twice. So we just need one sign of one interval, and then the rest of the signs can either be checked or can be filled out using multiplicity. 
What we don't want to do is try to sketch it, though, because what we end up having with rational functions is lots and lots of different possibilities for what happens on the end. Just because we end with a positive does not mean we are going to be going towards positive infinity. We might end up being a positive that trends towards 1. We might have a positive that gets close to 0. So don't worry about the sketch. We'll get there in the future. Just worry about the sign. Okay? All right, fill out the signs and give the answer. Tell your neighbors. What's the answer? Go. Yeah, what's the answer? When are we greater than or equal to zero? It's a question. It's a question. What are we waiting for? You have everything you need. Write down the answer. When are we greater than or equal to zero? When is your rational function greater than zero? Once you fill out your sign, you can do the rest. Mike, you have to fill out the sign. What are we waiting for? Post lunch nap. Is that what we're waiting for? Mike, if I plugged in something like zero, is this going to be positive or negative? If I plug in zero into my rational function, will I get a positive or a negative value? Thank you. What about something between negative 2 and negative 3? Guess what? You don't need to do the check. You know negative 2, its factor is occurring once which means to the right and left of negative 2, this factor is going to change signs, which means you're going to change signs. At negative 3, this factor x plus 3, its multiplicity is 1, to the right and left of negative 3, that factor is going to change signs. To the right and left of negative 5, this factor is going to change signs. Now, Mike, after you filled out the sign analysis, you then pay attention to the question, right, Linder? And the question is, when are you greater than or equal to zero? Yeah. Here, 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 and here. You make sure you fill out the correct intervals, which include negative 5 and include negative 3, close brackets, but do not include negative 2. Do this one, make this a greater than, make this a less than or equal to. Everybody, change, change the question. Everybody, everybody, second question, change it. Less than or equal to, go. Go, do the second question. Come on, we got this. We got this.
Thanks, dude. Thanks, Ron. No problem. Yep. Still a vertical asset. Because if I plugged in five, I get zero on the bottom. But the fact that it's squared is the sign won't change. Yes, but I would put negative seven on the left side because it's less than three. Three on the right side. Uh, interval notation is smallest of one. If you did inequality notation and you put your symbols in the right way, you wouldn't get money. Something happened, boss. You didn't pay attention to the square. Your signs are wrong. All right. Here we go. And then we're going to do another one, and then we got to move on. We got negative 7, 3, and 5. 5 is your vertical asymptote. It's an un. Now, what's important is that vertical asymptotes, just like zeros, don't have to change signs. You could have a vertical asymptote that looks like this, where to the right and left of the value, you're going in the same direction. This is a situation in which that occurs. If I plugged in six, I got all positives everywhere. If I plugged in four, this four minus five squared would remain that factor to be positive. That square, that multiplicity means x equals five is a no sign change. So we can use our multiplicity knowledge to fill out uh, sign charts just like we did with polynomials. But what do we pay attention to is that negative 7 and 3 are zeros of our rational function. So we list them off as zeros. We can continue to understand multiplicities to finish my sign chart. It's not positive, negative, positive, negative, but it's positive, positive, negative, positive. And now we have our zeros and our negatives. Very similar to polynomial um, inequalities, there could be like one point that needs to be included that might be a zero, but to the right and left are like the opposite signs that we're looking for. Okay, I would like you to change this one to this. I'd like you to change the next one to that. What, you already worked on it or something? Yeah. Well, sorry. Start over. I'd like you to change this one to x squared plus 7x plus 6. Because I need to show you something which you haven't seen yet. x squared plus 7x plus 6. We got this, buddy. We got this. Is this? There isn't one. There isn't one. There, it, 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 it has. But it's not a change. I don't know, Bacardi. I don't know. Let me ask you a question, McCarty. Would you say x equals negative 6 is in the domain? No. No. Would you say there is a point at negative 6? No. No. Negative 6 is a whole, but it's an und. There's no point there. Negative 1 is also an und. It's a vertical asymptote. Now, watch this, guys. Start with something like 0. Positive, positive, positive. Okay, I got positive. Shh, 
Multiplicity is one. This factor will change signs to the left and right of negative one, so I will change them. Okay. X plus six occurs twice. Right? That's another way of saying you got a multiplicity of two. You don't see a square, right? But you see this factor twice. Now, we know that negative six is the location of a whole. And if I plugged in negative six, I'd get zero over zero times negative five. That's negative one fifth. The whole's location is at negative one fifth. Well, as we pass through the whole's location, we will not change signs. The only time we'll change signs is if your whole's location actually happens to be zero. Boom. You see the signs don't change. You could double check if you plugged in negative three, positive, positive, negative. If you plugged in negative eight, this negative sign and this negative sign, since it's occurring twice, cancels, makes it that a positive, and this is still negative. So, boom, multiplicity two, no sign change. We're not changing signs at holes unless the hole is located at zero. To finish off when our x is bigger than or equal to zero, well, there's no zeros, so we're just that. Try it. There is. So minus one is uh, undefined. Yes. Minus one is a whole. There's no point. It's an undefined. So we're not including it. It's not a zero. Okay? Cool. This is a whole und. This is a vertical asymptote und. Great. Back to the second page. What if we have inequalities, but not bigger than or less than zero? This question is, when is our rational function x minus 1 over x plus 3 greater than 3? Or it could ask for less than 3. Cool? Cool. Well, Many of us, when we see this question, Thomas, this is what I was talking about, will think, oh, x minus 1 over x plus 3 greater than 3. Why don't I just multiply both sides by x plus 3? Go ahead, write this down. Let's, let's go ahead and do it. I get x minus 1. I don't know why mine's on the other side. It's weird is greater than 3x plus 9. All right, go ahead and solve that inequality for me, and let's see what happens. I got 2x's less than negative 10. I get x is less than negative 5. Got that? You guys get that? Cool. Looks like that's the answer. But go back to x minus 1 over x plus 3 and its graph. Here's x minus 1 over x plus 3. The question is, when was this bigger than 3, right? Well, here's y equals 3. Um... I said that it was when x is less than negative 5. Well, that's not correct. It's here when we are bigger than 3. It's not here. We're below 3 here. It's not here. We're below 3. It's actually between this asymptote and negative 5. So what happens? By multiplying by this denominator, we removed our knowledge and the importance of the vertical asymptote. This is not the way to go. Cross it off. Great job. It looks algebraically sound, but it removes the importance of the asymptote to signs 
and to inequalities, and we can't have that. We need that asymptote. So what do you think is another way to go? Tell your neighbors. We can't multiply by x plus 3. What do you think we should do? Go. What do we think we do? How do we do that? So that'll be 1 if I divide by 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1. Okay, ready? Inequalities are tough when they're not greater than or less than zero. Inequalities are tough when they're not greater than or less than zero. We want an inequality and zero. We know how to do inequalities and zeros. We've already done a couple. What we need to do is subtract three. When I subtract three from the right side, boom, I got a zero. This is very similar to the quiz question we had where we have like two expressions. We want to find the zeros. Well, now we have two expressions and an inequality. What we want to do here, tell your neighbors, what do you want to do here? What do you want to do here? Tell your neighbors. Common denominator is the key. Common denominator will be the key. Multiply this minus 3 by an x plus 3. I'm going to make this a negative 3. I'm going to distribute. I got x minus 1 plus negative 3x minus 9 over x plus 3 is greater than 0. I get negative 2x minus 10, something that is familiar to me from like here is greater than 0. But instead of like just having an answer, we break out our signs. We know negative 3 is an undefined, it's a vertical asymptote. We also find that it should be negative 5, so let me start over. Add 10, divide by negative 2. We get negative 5 is a 0. We get negative 3 is a vertical asymptote or an undefined. We do our sign analysis. Be careful. If I plugged in 0, I'd have 0 minus 10. That's a negative divided by 0 plus 3. That's a positive. That makes this a negative. Now, I can tell that my multiplicities are 1. I'm not having any squares or any holes where it occurs twice. So I will change signs. I will change signs. And then voila, what we were looking for, this negative 5 to negative 3, that shows up. Okay, so when we remove the asymptote, everything just goes wrong. Negative 5 to negative 3. Moving on. <clears throat> Why is x equals 1 a vertical asymptote to 1 over x minus 1? Why? And don't say because you get a number over 0. Explain why x equals 1 is the location of a vertical asymptote. Why? Hey neighbors, why? Thank you. Oh, we got to know why. It's because of the table that you guys, like, looked at. If you plugged in 1, yes, you get an undefined, sure. But let's say we plugged in 1.001. 
okay? I would get 1 divided by 0 0.001 because I have 1.001 minus 1. Now that's 1 1,000th. One, 1 divided by 1 1,000th 1, is 1,000. As I get closer and closer and closer to the value 1, I will end up dividing by something smaller and smaller and smaller. And we see in one side, we're going to get this positive large number. On the other side, I would end up with negative 0 0.001, which will end up being negative 1,000. If I added another 9, I'd add another 0. If I added another 0, I'd add another 0. So we can see we would just produce larger and larger y values either large negative y values or large positive y values. Because if I plugged in 0 0.999, 0 0.999 minus 1 would be negative 0 0.001. Are we cool with that? Okay. Our goal, guys, is not only identifying that you have a vertical asymptote, but identifying the behavior of your function around your vertical asymptote. Will you be going up or down towards positive infinity or negative infinity to the left of your vertical asymptote? Will you be going up or down towards positive or negative infinity to the right of your vertical asymptote? This is what we're going to try to figure out. Well, for x, uh, equals 1 and 1 over x plus 1. If I look to the left of 1, we can denote that using limit, uh, limit notation by, okay, what's the limit as x approaches 1, but just to the left of 1? I put a little negative symbol in the exponent of 1. It means I'm looking to the left. It means what's happening at 0.9999, just to the left of 1. Now, I did it. I plugged in 0.9999. I subtracted 1. I got a value close to 0, but in fact, it was a negative value. I have a 1 divided by something negative and close to 0. I got something large and negative. This is going to be an answer, an infinity, like our end behaviors, only it's vertical asymptote behavior. You can look to the right of your vertical asymptote. And to denote to the right, you will use a plus in the exponent of your number. This is new, so make sure you're paying attention. This little exponent that's a negative or a positive means to the right or to the left. If you're looking to the right of 1, you're thinking about 1.001. Well, I plugged in 1.001, I subtracted 1, I got something very, very close to 0, but it was positive. 1 divided by something close to 0 and it's positive got me something very, very large and positive. And this will be my answer. What this analysis is telling me is that to the left of x equals 1, I'll be going down. And this little behavior is going to win. To the right of x equals 1, I'll be going up. And this behavior is going to win. So you're going to be able to understand, like, what is the direction through this analysis around your vertical asymptote. Now, the way I did it with these numbers are actually harder than what we've been doing all along. If I gave you this function and I said, do a sign chart for this function. Go ahead, do it. Do a sign chart for this function. Do a sign chart for x minus 5 over x plus 4, just like you did. Go. Give me the signs. You got the signs? Do you have the uns and the zeros? Do you have a zero and a VA? All right, well, now you can answer the question then. Negative 4 is a vertical asymptote. 5 
is a zero, right? We got positive, negative, positive. Well, if negative four is a vertical asymptote, and to the left of negative four, you have positive, you know vertical asymptotes will trend towards infinity as you get close to it. You know that to the left of your vertical asymptote, you have to be going up because you have positive. You know to the right of your vertical asymptote, you got to be going down because you got negative. Does that make sense? So, to the left of my vertical asymptote, because I have positive values, I must be trending towards positive infinity. To the right of my vertical asymptote, because to the right of negative 4, I have negative, I must be trending towards negative infinity. This is one way to do it. You want another way, I Sure. Here we go. What's a number negative 4 plus? Tell your neighbors, what would be a number negative 4 plus that you would think about? A number that's approaching negative 4 to the right. Give your neighbors a number. Cool. Negative 3.9. Cool. If you think about negative 3.9 or negative 3.99999, you plug in negative 3.999 and subtract 5. It's really close to negative 4 minus 5. That's going to give you negative 9. If you plug in negative 3.999 and add 4, that's going to be a number that's close to 0 but positive. What is a negative number divided by something close to 0 but positive? Oh, it's going to be very, very large and negative. It's a different way to do it. If I'm to the left of negative 4, like negative 4.0001, subtract 5, I'm still close to negative 9. But add 4, I'm going to get a number close to 0 that's negative. Something divided by something very small is very big, but a negative divided by a negative is a positive. This is similar to how Mr. Huffaker shows it in this homework video, which you have access to. But if you do a sign chart and you do it correctly and you know you have a vertical asymptote, you can get the same answers. So whatever works for you, let's get the answers to this one. Do your sign chart or plug in 2.001 and 1.999. Do your sign chart. Do your sign chart. Oh, you see that multiplicity life term? That's big. Don't put negative 3 down. Don't put 3 down. That's not a 0. Only 2 is a 0. It's not x minus 3. Oh, nice. Two is not a 0. 2 is a vertical asymptote. Use one test point somewhere. Three. Three. Negative three divided by three minus two squared. Negative. The multiplicity of your factor x minus two is two. No sign change. Since you have a vertical asymptote, you know you're trending towards infinity you are going to be negative to the left of it. You're going to be negative to the right of it. So in both directions of your vertical asymptote, you're trending towards negative infinity. You can do that or think about plugging in 2.001. You get a positive value close to zero divided by negative three. Boom. Same thing here. Okay. Thank you.